industry. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening for colleagues in uh, Southeast Asia, Asia, generally speaking, and welcome to our uh, ongoing series of webinars. Today, uh, it'll be extremely interesting. We've got 10 speakers, the webinar topic of artificial intelligence, faith, and science. Um, to uh, all our esteemed speakers, a very warm welcome to our guests who are attending. Um, we thank you uh, for taking time out from your busy schedules to be with us. Um, so what I will do is in the next two to three minutes, set the table for what we will be talking about and what our esteemed speakers will be speaking about. The topic of AI, faith, and intelligence, um, it's genesis, at least for us, when we were thinking about programs in this space, started off with a New York Times article uh, concerning, is there God on Silicon Valley, or is God needed in Silicon Valley? We thought about that, and we said, I think we need to have an <coughs> inclusive uh, approach uh, to this. So what we're trying to do here is address the big questions in life. What does it mean to be human? Faith or spirituality, interfaith dialogue, or part of healing. We wanted to take interfaith uh, or spirituality and then combine that with science and then add technology to it. What's trending right now uh, is the area for industrial revolution, uh, AI, and there are a lot of challenges within AI and ethics. So if we combine interfaith or spirituality, science and technology, I think we're going to find some very interesting um, areas for discussion. AI, faith and science, AI is just about math. If you think about it, it's a lot of math and it's said by many to be intelligence by brute force. Some in Silicon Valley call it semi-divine. Basically, uh, uh, there's a saying uh, in Silicon Valley uh, by a small minority, who needs God when you have Google? So there's a lot to think about there. What AI and faith have in common is following, as said by uh, some writers, artificial intelligence creates groups and categories, and then what you do to those categories. Faith at one level works in a similar way where you're in the group or you're in another group and then what happens thereafter. There's a joke uh, also that I wanted to share with you before I talk about um, this area in depth on uh, the slide here itself. It's, um, there's a group of super intelligent data scientists and they're trying to create an artificial uh, intelligent system to answer the question, is there God? So they created the system and then they asked the question, is there God? The response from the system was, there's not enough capacity in computing power 
to answer that question. So they went back to their laboratories and linearly uh, uh, enhanced it and asked the same question. And the response was the same. Then uh, they went back to the uh, laboratory again and asked the same question, um, is there a God? And with so much supercomputing power, the AI system now there is. So you see what is happening in terms of the concern of AI uh, with respect to it potentially having inroads um, in this area. So what this particular slide is highly, if we can go back to the first one, if you could just go back, please. What this slide is about, and this set, sets the foundation is uh, artificial intelligence, faith and science, as, as I said, in the New York Times opinion, Pete, can Silicon Valley find God? Absolutely interesting uh, uh, take. It's a long read, but it's well worth, well worth the time for you to read it. Um, it basically starts off by a uh, president of Microsoft, who uh, in uh, his book, Tools and Weapons, The Promise and Peril of Digital Age, he says that the ethical principles of artificial intelligence require even a bigger tent with different stakeholders and representatives of the world's many faiths need to be under the tent. Uh, next, please. So if we look at uh, Christianity and science, and I won't read everything here, just focus in on the highlighted point. And it says the easiest way to understand this is to see that science has to do with mechanisms, whereas the Bible has to do with meaning. Science tells us about the how, and the Bible tells us about the why. Next, please. If we look at Buddhism and science, um, we basically uh, see the philosophical and psychological uh, teachings within Buddhism share commonalities with modern scientific and philosophical thought. There's alignment. That's what the uh, uh, takeaway is there. Next, please. And if we look at the Jewish traditions, uh, it basically says, uh, while well, science explains how the world works, the Jewish tradition exposes why the world works. And science and Jewish tradition uh, were understood to be two different manifestations of the divine truth. And if we look at Hinduism, and this is from, uh, okay, where, and this is from Oxford Handbooks, uh, Hinduism has a, as a religion has coexisted with scientific pursuits, the underpinnings of such partnerships and the significant contributions of such dialogues to current engagements between science and spirituality. And finally, if we look at what Islam says, where the Quran ins instructs Muslims to basically uh, seek knowledge to explain the universe and find signs of Allah in his creation. So this sets up the table for our 10 speakers to have a deeper dive in each of these areas. Um, I think this is going to be a very interesting and innovative because we'll hear from other faith leaders uh, and experts in this. So I'll stop here and it gives me immense, immense pleasure and honor to introduce um, a colleague who I have learned uh, uh, in the last few months and I've been on a few seminars with him is Professor Dato Dr. Ansari, the president and CEO of Asia E University, which houses the Asia uh, Center for Tourism and Technology. He's a president and CEO, as I said, at Asia E University and speed, uh, da, uh, Dato Dr. Ansari, the podium is yours, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Rushdi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very good morning, a very good afternoon, a very good evening, wherever you are in the world. I was asked to say a few words uh, for this very, very interesting webinar, which uh, I think involving so many interfaiths. Being a scientist, I'm not in the faith area, but more on the science, science area. So let me just go on the scientific side of things. Say the history of technology has shown us that as humans, we are constantly trying to create something more intelligent than ourselves. From the first time a human looked at their own reflection to the invention of the computer, our quest for understanding has been one of curiosity and wonder. And, and right now, Muslims across the world can download apps such as Quran, Hadith, daily prayers, timetables, electronic compass, etc. Other apps automatically adjust fasting times during the month of Ramadan, depending on the location of a device. And I think this is not unique to the Muslims. Practically every faith has got such kind of apps, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the smartphone. In fact, Muslims 
are one of the most plugged in religious communities due to the high concentration of young people between age 16 and 30. A survey by Pew Research Center in 2017 showed that poorer Muslim majority countries boast a large amount of people with smartphones. 57% of Palestinians, for example, own a smartphone, just short of Germany's 60%. Interestingly, in June last year, Facebook announced the winners of its ethics and AI research initiative in the Asia Pacific and gave a $25,000 grant to support the integration of diverse traditional knowledge from around the world into the study of artificial intelligence. Among those selectors were two professors, Dr. Junaid Khadir and Dr. Amana Rakib, two Pakistani academics who have been studying how Islamic ethical and legal practices can be used to regulate AI in the Muslim countries. Islam professes ethical traditions going back more than 1,400 years, says Khadir, Chair of Electrical Engineering at Lahore Information Technology University. Muslim AI researchers have reignited a long-standing debate about the relationship between modern liberalism and Islam. Should algorithms be allowed to play God? This is what Dr. Rushdie was talking about in the Silicon Valley. There's a lack of representation in AI for the two billion people who profess this, the, Muslim, the Islamic faith. And Qadir and Rakib believe that their work will pluck some of the gaps for the, for the Muslim world. They believe that liberal regulation of technology has precipitated a moral crisis in the Islamic world where colonial values and traditional values and Islamic values have been supplanted by native worldviews. Much of the advancement that has taken place over the last century has been imposed on Muslims, not created by Muslims at all, argues Rakib, a professor of philosophy and ethics at Karachi's Institute of Business Administration. As a result, no one asked the critic, critic, crucial question of why we need these technologies in the first place. Take the simple case of driverless cars or autonomous cars. For Kadir, how an Islamically minded automobile might react if forced to choose between running over a pedestrian or crashing and killing the driver, a popular thought experiment in AI circles, he says that that is the wrong question to ask. He believes AI should be designed, first of all, to do no harm. Any new technology should be judged on this basis. It should be doing good rather than harm. But we all know it's a double-edged sword. Even if Kadir argues this entails delays in developing ideas or even shelving them, then so be it. Is it really useful to have a device that presents you only harmful options to choose from, which is basically very un-Islamic? Interestingly, the Islamic jurist Al-Ghazali posed a predecessor to the trolley problem as early as the 11th century, when he asked his students whether one might be justified in throwing some passengers off a sinking ship if it meant saving the life of the majority. In Islam, we call it the concept of maslaha, the good of the majority. The rise of pseudo-sacred industry practices stems in large part from a greater sense of awareness among tech workers of the harms and dangers of artificial intelligence and the growing public appetite to hold Silicon Valley to account for its creations. Over the past several years, scholarly research has exposed the racist and discriminatory assumptions baked into the machine learning algorithms. And this is very true. The 2018 presidential election, for example, showed how social media algorithms can be easily exploited and manipulated. Mr. Botcher, former GM of Microsoft, who is doing his PhD research study on the relationship between spirituality and technology, he had people from six faith backgrounds, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and non-religious, who had agreed to participate in his, in his study. Something, sim something similar to this particular international webinar. He programmed a series of AI devices to tailor the responses according to respective spiritual affiliations. The questions though stayed the same. How am I of value? How did all of this come about? Why is there evil and suffering in the world? Is there God or something bigger than all of us? And he hopes, Mr. Butcher hopes, that he, by analyzing the responses from each of these phase, we'll be able to understand how our devices are transforming the way society thinks about what he called the big questions of life, the mm. question of whether Silicon Valley can play God or not. In this sense, machine learning and religion 
might be said to operate according to similar domestic uh, logistics. This is, this is indeed peculiar. One of the fundamental functions of AI is to create groups and to create categories and codify them and then do things with those categories. Don't religions also work in the same way? I think this is a very interesting question for us to, to discuss. Uh, and I believe that this international webinar with so many distinguished panelists on it will, I'm sure, be able to come to some kind of what they call consensus on the role of AI and the role of, in, uh, of faith and how do we now reconcile faith, science uh, together. And I, I wish you all the very best in this, in this deliberations. And I'll be lo I'm looking forward to listening to all the respective different faiths discussing on this very important, as I say, big questions uh, in life. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rushdi, for giving me the opportunity to say a few words at the beginning of this international seminar. Wa billahi tawfiq wal hidayah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Dear Professor Dato Ansari Ahmed, thank you very much for laying the table on the landscape and then what some of the challenges are and how we collectively as humanity uh, with different affiliations are working towards a common goal, which is the pursuit of good. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is a colleague of mine and we are working on an undertaking involving artificial intelligence. His name is Azar Mustafa, and he's going to talk about the Quranic Ayat and AI on the transfer, learning forensics and advisory. Um, this is going to be extremely interesting from the point of, uh, of, of all of us, because I've not seen this type of presentation applied before in the context of the Holy Book for Muslims, which is the Quran. So um, Brother Azar, the podium is yours. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can I share my screen? Yes. yes. All right. Bismillahir uh, Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Uzha. Okay, I'm uh, one of the practitioner in artificial intelligence. I've been practicing probably more than 15 years. So I'm coming from the artificial intelligence angle and try to relate what I've read in Quran. Okay. So I hope this can be a mind opening for a lot of people and actually engage Muslims to do more on artificial intelligence. Right. So I'm, I'm going to go live on the first slide. Uh, I'll talk a bit about artificial intelligence itself. Basically, it's a technology to simulate human thinking, to perform a task. So we think every day. Last time, we're talking about software that perform functions. Now we're talking about software that perform thinking. Okay, that's, that's the main difference. So in order for, you, for AI to think, it takes various inputs from records, perception, voice, measurement, service, and so on. Okay, it's just like human, we, we do read, we do see, we do hear. It's actually the same kind of same kind of input. So when we talk about learning in AI, in order for the software to be able to perform some thinking, it has to learn. So when we talk about learning in AI, we talk about AI modeling. So you talk, we, we you heard these words a lot. AI modeling, AI mod it's, it means that it's, it's about learning in AI. Okay, so. Um, the first thing that we talk about uh, uh, the process is annotation of group of data. Okay, in this example, we talk about how we want to build a model to learn about cat and not. So, cat. so what we do is to we give uh, we actually label a lot of pictures about cat and non cat. Is uh, normally we probably label more than one million pictures or a bit less than that. So once we label the, the images, we actually feed it into a software that can learn. So you see like a neuron there, that's actually deep learning. There's a lot of models that you can use, supervised learning, uh, vector machine and so on. You can do that. But the whole idea is you feed in the, the, the data that you want the AI to learn and you get a, a model. So 
once you get the model, you you put a live feed and it is is able to 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 actually see whether an image is a cat or not cat. That's it. That's the basic of it. Okay. So one thing that we need to know is we can treat a model. It's like a group that think deeply on a subject. Okay. It's a it's a group. It's, it's what we call narrow AI. Okay. You 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 heard about this narrow AI. What it means is you 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 take a subject you think really deep and normally it's done by a group that actually get the data and so on that's the reason why i say a group that think deeply on the subject because i want to go to the next part which is i want to talk about um quran and transfer learning okay this is the first part that uh, I, I, we talk about quran and ai so in surah al jatiya ayat 13 it says and has subjected to you all that is in the skies and all that is in this earth it is all as a favor and kindness from Allah. Verily, in it there are signs for groups of people who think deeply. So I like to look uh, look at the Arabic words. Means there's a nation with many groups, and this group works together, and they are thinking deeply about many subjects. Okay, that's it's it's talking about uh, groups that works together so every group is actually given a subject to work on and actually try to think on so if we look at the model we said just now we're talking about one ai model it's just like a group that think really on the subject we can actually see we can take the concept and apply it to, a, to a, what what we say in ai what we call transfer learning okay in this picture in the transfer learning you can see that you want to model a car Okay, more the software that can identify a car. So you put a model, uh, you embed and a model on cats inside it. Okay, it's like this is what a concept called transfer learning. So if you imagine that so many groups that actually focus, so this group is what we call a, uh, narrow AI. It works together, so you can mix and match all this model, and that's where you get the the transfer learning. And when you do transfer learning, you get a better results because you learn from the other group. Okay. But there is something that uh, what is interesting about transfer learning, unnecessary part of a cat model will not be used. So uh, I don't show you the, the full detail. What it means like what is not useful for the learning, you don't use it. Okay. So uh, in other words, you can say when you talk about transfer learning, you talk about you also about uh, I think in, in Muslims we have many factions and groups that actually work together. And actually, we can always learn from each other and to, to get something better. That's actually about transfer learning. Okay. Now we talk about Quran and forensic. Okay. So in Surah Al Fusila ayat 22, it says, You did not bother to hide yourself from your ears, eyes, and skin to prevent them from testifying against you. Rather, you assume that Allah did not know much about what you used to do. Okay, if you really think about it, this is actually the status uh, your ears, your eyes, and your skin is where your identity is. So you use your retina to actually be identified. You use your fingerprint to get uh, to be identified. So Allah is saying 1400 years ago in the Quran that, well, during that time, people don't talk about fingerprint. But this is what's happening right now. Your fingerprint is what will identify you. Okay. You can go get really deep okay, with the 8K pictures and so on. If you can zoom in into the retina, you probably can actually identif identify who is that person. So Quran is talking about forensic in, in the sense of the Ahira, but actually it's happening right now. Okay. So this is about Quran and forensic. I go next. It's a bit fast. So this is the word, uh, uh, this is ayah from Surah Yasin. Innama tunziru manita ba'an zikra wa shiya rahman bil ghaib fabashiru bi maghfirati wa ajun kareem. You can only want those who follow the reminder. Okay. So what he's saying is you want to recommend something to the other person. You make sure the other person is interested in what you want to tell. Okay. This is the basis for what we call recommendation engine. All right. So you see the example in Facebook, Google, and Netflix. After you actually watch few of the movies, the engine actually models you and kind of know your interests and it starts recommending the right thing for you. Same as in, the, in, uh, in eBay, in uh, Amazon, and so on, it's modeling you. So 
God is saying something about the algorithm actually. If you want to to recommend something, make sure you understand what they like. Okay, that's actually the words. Okay, so this is actually something a bit on advisory. The same thing if you want to uh, advise someone, you make sure there is a common value that the person will be interested in. So the other thing that that the the ayah say is if. The, the importance of building a common value and love in your family or group. So advisory will be heard. Okay. I mean, I, I'm talking about the, the message. And at the same time, you can apply those ayah into the, the, the algorithm itself. I mean, imagine this is being said 1400 years ago. If someone in the year of 700 think about this and try to apply it, maybe we we, we, we some, uh, same as a fingerprint. I, I don't really research when fingerprint is used. But if you really think deeply, Allah is saying about fingerprint 1400 years ago. Okay, so there are a few ayah that we can actually take from Quran to actually do our, our approaches. So some of it is uh, an ayah on thinking of reflection. I'm talking about right now, people are going into general AI. So one of the things when you talk about general AI is reasoning. So there are, there's a lot of actually ayah about thinking in Quran. For example, these words, this is hypothetical thinking. Or were they created by nothing? Or they are, or are they their own creators? Or did they create the heavens and earth? In fact, they have no firm belief in Allah. This is a hypothetical situation. So at this point of time, uh, when we build the AI, uh, we haven't come to that stage yet where we build AI to do hypothetical, th th hypothetical thinking. There are, there are about 20 ayah in Quran about the way of thinking that we can actually apply to general AI. Okay. So uh, there's also ayah on system dynamics. Okay, do people think we cannot reassemble the bones? Yes, indeed. We are most capable of restoring even their very fingertips. Actually, from this ayah, Allah is saying that, look, if you want to design hand and fingers, look at the structure of the bones. You've got to follow one by one to have the best. I mean, if you try to apply this in the, the robotic areas. So, so these are certain ayahs that I actually picked up, but there are many ayahs that talk about system dynamics, actually, in Quran. And you're talking about uh, the output and outcomes also, okay? This is the same ayah I used in uh, for Surah Yasin. You can only warn those who won't follow the reminder and are in awe of the most compassionate without seeing him. What he's saying is the outcome of the AI need to be able to turn the person or what you recommend to turn the person into an awe with, the, with, the, with Allah. That's what he's saying actually. So, that, I mean, if you really think carefully, the algorithm that is used in Facebook is more like an anarchist. It's just, they let it go by itself. But there, there is no there is no direction because the AI actually fits on human weakness, not human strength. That's why the problem right now, if you want to do something bad, you can get it at the tip of the bat. You want to do some sin, it's just at the tip of your finger. So that's that's the uh, the, the thing we talk about something or approaches from Quran. So I stop right now. I mean, I mean, uh, this is just an opening. There are many ayah that you can use. I mean, we're talking about general AI right now. Um, rational thinking and so on. We haven't gone that far. We we've done some similarity thinking. We 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 haven't gone into factual thinking. We haven't gone into proving proof and thinking and so on. I mean, which is like we the next uh, the next vision of AI itself. So I stop right now and I give you back to Dr. Rashdi to continue. Okay. Thank you, uh, brother Azhar. Yeah. Um, enlightening, deeply penetrating. Uh, where science is confirming what faith, Quran more specifically, has talked about. Um, incredible insights on transfer learning, recommendation engines aligned to what uh, algorithms are about, um, reflection and thinking, system dynamics, uh, output and outcome. I think this is the first time at least I've heard this said in this uh, particular context. So thank you very much. And for those who have questions and comments and want to get in touch with uh, Brother Azar, please um, uh, feel free to um, write your questions uh, and, and, and chat. So our next speaker, Haile, um is someone that's uh, close to me. He's actually my father. His name is Dr. A.M. Siddiqui. He is a surgeon. Uh, he was a surgeon. He's retired for 40 plus years. And he brings a very interesting dynamics 
into the area of science and human embryology within the umbrella of the faith, Islam. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, and uh, what you will see him talk about are excerpts from the book, uh, much like Azhar talked about artificial intelligence and parallelisms to Islam, he's going to basically take you on a stage-by-stage -stage basis on how uh, what the Quran has said is confirmed by science. So um, I hand it over to my father, Dr. Siddiqui. Gentlemen and ladies, assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Ahmad Muti Siddiqui. The present discussion is Quranic Ayat and Modern Science of Human Embryology. My name is Ahmad Muti Siddiqui, as I mentioned. Thank you very much for including me in this uh, important conference. Professionally, I'm a surgeon. I was teaching, I was in practice of surgery in New York for about 40 years. Presently, I'm retired and very busy in learning and sharing with ever unfolding mystery, the truth of the Quran. As mentioned, this very short talk is on a study of development of embryo mentioned in Quran Park, revealed about 1450 years ago, that proves the facts of most modern human embryology. It deals with the cellular and molecular level of special cells, that is sperms and ovum, the egg, interacting together, known as fertilization, thus developing into a new human being under divine guidance through DNA and assigned genes. Allah insana malam yalam. Allah ta'ala taught insan which they did not know. This is for the Yaqome Yatafakkarun, for people to think. And of course, Allah knows the best. Can I have a uh, slide? This is slide number one. The, this is the, the previous slide which was shown here was the book we I published in 2015. And in that book, uh, the book is Khalaqal uh, Insana. This is it. Yes, this is this book. The Khalaqal Insana Minala, Asane Taqwim, God's creation on human in the best mode. The Quranic uh, discourse on human embryology. Uh, I have uh, dealt here 10 ayat of Quran Park, which very closely related to the uh, human modern human embryology. Out of the, those uh, many, many uh, slides, I've picked up over 10 slides to present it today and share with you people. And thank you very much for sharing. Please, can I have the next one, please? This slide, thank you very much. Uh, this is about uh, uh, about the anatomical site of embryogenesis of testes. The Quran Park mentions uh, in uh, Surah Tariq, the number is uh, 87, ayat 5, 6, and 7. The ayat is mentioned here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Fal yunzul insana mimma khuliqa. Khuliqa mimma indafiq. Yakhruju mimma in sulbe wa tribe. Here you you emphasis is on soul and thrive. Thrive is the curb, curb bone, which is shown here, the curb bone. This is the whole skeleton of thoracic area and upper lumbar area. And the testis, which is growing, the Quran Park mentioned, and embryologically, this test is growing in between the soul here and the curb bone called as uh, ribs. If we take the cross section here, you see here the backbone, the, the vertebra, and this is the curved bone called uh, the ribs. And here it is the future testis, which is developing between the backbone and curved bone. This is what the Quran Sharif says, and this is what the um, embryogenesis of testes, anatomical site of the testes is formed. sulbe This is the sul and this is the tarab. And this is the testes developing. What happens after the testes is 
they develop it descends into the scrotum it doesn't live stay in this area where it has grown it descends into a permanent place outside the body into the scrotal sac it grows into the scrotal sac over there for the rest of the uh, man's life the, it descends because the testes grows and functions well in lower temperature the, than the body core temperature and in the scrot in scrotum the temperature is about uh, 2 to 4 degree lower than the body core temperature okay can i have the next slide please now this is about the mandafir. What is mandafir? That is the, the projectile fluid. The projectile fluid, the constituents of the projectile fluids are the sperm from the testes. This is the testes, the producing the sperm. Here is the testes in the diagram shown producing the uh, sperm which goes to the channel. And these are the three glands. This is this is the gland called as uh, it's, a, it's a seminal vesicle, and this is a prostate gland, and here is bulbo urethral gland. These secretions plus the sperm is called as the mandafir, the projectile fluid. The fluid, uh, the secretion of the gland keeps the sperm motile, healthy, and keeps the pH in normal. This is about the mandafir mentioned in the Quran part. Now, can I have this next slide, please? It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, chronic ayat. Inna khalaqna linsana min nutfatin imshaj. The imshaj was translated as a chain or in Urdu, which is called as lacha. This was translated. I have gone through the re and research about this one. The only person who has translated uh, this imshaj as a chain by a uh, very well-known alim of 19, uh, 19th century, Sir Sayyid Suleiman Nadbi. He translated this whole ayat in Urdu and says that Hamne insan ko ek boon ke lachhe se paida kiya. The English translation is we created human with a chain in sperm. And this is the chain. This is what you see the chain. And this chain in embryological language is the DNA. See that? This is the DNA. And the DNA, the formula of the DNA, DNA is represented by, uh, the formula of the DNA was created by Francis Crick and Jim Watson. These are two microbiologists. They, uh, they discovered this formula in, in 1953. And when they discovered the formula, they claim that they, they have discovered the secret of life, but they did not know that this secret of life, the Imsha, the DNA, was already mentioned 1450 years ago in Quran Park. You can have the next slide, please. This is about the fertilization and the, uh, the sex of the embryo the uh, sex of the alak, which uh, turns into embryo and ultimately the fully grown child. The, the every, uh, every organ of the body is made up of small, tiny, tiny particles called as cells. The cells, every cell has that 46 chromosome. Human being, the man is represented by the sex organ called as testes and woman is uh, represented by the organ called ovaries. The parent cell of the, uh, of the sperm which, uh, which fertilizes the egg, the parent cell of the, uh, of, the, of the sperm is also having 46 chromosomes. The out of 46 chromosomes, 44 are regular chromosomes and two are the sex chromosomes. And those sex chromosomes are labeled as X and Y. So the man is represented by a formula uh, which has chromosomes, 46 chromosomes. Out of 46 chromosomes, 44 
are the normal and two are the sex chromosomes. Two, those two sex chromosomes are called X and Y chromosome. In female, in the ovary, the formula is the 44 plus X and X. These are identical sex chromosomes. Let us now the, decipher the eye in Quran path. The eye says, Innahu khalaqa zawjayna zikra إِنَّهُ خَلَقَ الزَّوْجَيْنَ الزِّكْرَ وَالْأُنْسَى مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ إِذَا تُمْنَا And that he created the two spouses, male and female, from a drop, when it is poured forth. So here is Quran Shaykh is claiming that it is the sperm, it is the sperm which is responsible for the sex for the sex of Zaujan, male and female. Let us see how it happens. Uh, the parent cell of the sperm divides and that division is called as reduction division. So the, after division, the two types of sperms are produced. One is 12, uh, 22 plus X, the, the, and, uh, and the other is 20 plus, 22 plus y. Similarly, the egg is also produced after reduction division, two types of x. One is 22 plus x and the other is 20 plus x. Now let us, uh, let us uh, see how the sperm is responsible for the sex of both the sex. What happens, take this sperm of x type, here it is, the sperm of x type, fertilizing the, that is 22 plus X, fertilizing the ovum or the egg, which is 22 plus X, total number will be 44 plus XX. That 44 plus XS, we know it is represent the Allah, which is a female, and that developed into a girl. So, second scenario is when the sperm of Y chromosome, 22 plus Y, fertilizes the egg 20 plus, 22 plus X, total number will be 44 plus XY. This 44 plus XY, as we know, is the male. So this is the male alap, which has got 44 plus XY chromosome, and that develops into a boy. So ultimately, this is the sperm, which is responsible for development of sex of male and female. Can I have other slide, please? Here is the Quran Park is saying, Summa Jalna, Summa Jalna, Nutfatin Fi Karare Makin. After fertilization, the, 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 uh, the fertilized egg then implants into the internal wall of the uterus that is called an endometrium. How this happened? Let us see here. Here is the ovum which is released from an ovary which is situated somewhere. The ovum is taken up from the open end of the fallopian tube. This is the structure, half of the structure of the uterus. This is the wall of the uterus, this is the fallopian tube. So here's the ovum which is taken over by the open end of the fallopian tube. And it comes over here every month and it stays here for two to four days. If ma and dafa with the sperms are are put into the vagina, then the millions of our sperms are released. They pass through the cavity of the uterus, goes to the fallopian tube and fertilizes the egg hair waiting for the sperm. Only one sperm, only one sperm, fortunate sperm fertilizes. Out of fertilization is called as alak. The alak is moves backward and goes to the uterus and for implantation. Four to six days, it comes in here and for him. While it is going back, the, the, the nucleus divides in multiple time. And after it, in four to six days, it becomes a multi, multi cellular entity, which has got, which is called as uh, uh, these, these 
this uh, this is called as what do you call it the psycho this is called as the psycho and uh, in uh, in uh, arabic it is called as uh, muzwa muzwa is uh, in arabic muzwa means uh, a chewed uh, chewed piece of uh, flesh so after it is fertilized as shown here it implant muzwa implants here muzwa has that outer wall which secretes and makes a hole digests a small portion of endometrium and then slips into the endometrium and then it stays here permanently till it is grown into a female can I have male or female can I have the next slide please yeah the focus on the i says focus on the lesama lemon means the bone is all enveloped by the muscles this is the precursor of the bone in the form of cartilage and the whole thing is the limb of the embryo this cartilage is replaced by special cells called as steobloids and which deposit the bone cells and during course of time it makes the the whole bone takes its uh, shape around the developing muscles here the cross section of adult which shows that bone is here the humerus bone of the arm and surrounded by the muscles here humerus bone of and this of ulna and two bones of forearm surrounded surrounded by the muscles here so the in, it is the embryogenesis we know it we can feel it the bone is surrounded by the muscle it is the embryogenesis which says fakason is fakason is amalam means the bone is developed around uh, inside the muscles can i have next slide please that 3 minutes okay the, the this is the final slide here so it says the quran shaif says ya khalqu fi butun ummahatikum khalqan min baad khalqin fi zulumat salas so the 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 embryo takes up while is developing in, in implanted and developing into into different shapes it means you know alqa musba etc which is the thing and very important thing which is ranshi mentions here that it develops into a darkness into the darkness surrounded by three veils what are the three veils the three veils are shown here the first veil is the wall of the uterus the second is the another veil called as uh, is called as corian and third is the blue one is shown as amnia this is this is the fully grown fetus of the uh, uh, baby which is ready for the delivery now the final slide please the last slide please here is the summary of that whole discussion we have gone through what happened this is the testes which is developed Developed between crab, which is the between crab and sperm. The sperm must produce this. The sperm fertilizing the egg, and the egg zygote is formed. Then the zygote or the muzwa going through the fallopian tube, then implanted here. This is shape of the muzwa. The teeth looks like a teeth mark here, and you have got here the imshad. the dna the here you have got the bone enveloped by the muscle and this is a fetus which is growing into three walls or three veils the uterine wall corian wall amnion wall and ultimately the uh, the delivery the female 44 plus xx and the male 44 plus x by the uh, this is the majesty of nature the miracle of human creation khalaq al insan min alaq fi ahsan at taqwim this is my talk and thank you for sparing your time and listening to this uh, this very interesting 
uh, a, then ayat, which is very closely represent, uh, represent the modern uh, human embryology. And thank you. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui, for that um, overview and details at the appropriate area of the development uh, where science confirms once again what was written 1400 years ago. You spoke about the processes and the stages, so thank you very much. Uh, these are the two books he's written, um, and if you need to get in touch with him, uh, his email uh, we can provide also. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is a dear friend of mine, and he is leading some of the efforts at iPortal. His name is Dr. Sri Kumar. Um, he is basically the brainchild between DHS hospitality area, and he's going to talk about Hinduism, the way of life. We're all looking forward to his uh, presentation. Uh, he's a great storyteller with a huge amount of insights, depth, and knowledge. So, Dr. Sri, the podium is yours. Okay. Uh, a very good morning, uh, Dr. Roshti. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And a very good afternoon and uh, a very good evening to, to everyone. Okay, uh, my topic today is on Hinduism, the way of life. Uh, Hinduism is a religion that is, uh, what I would say is misunderstood, uh, practiced in different ways. Uh, and as a practicing Hindu, uh, this is something that uh, I have seen and uh, I came into this talk because uh, the speaker was unable to come and Dr. Rosti uh, spoke to me and I was doing some reading and I realized that I was practicing some things wrongly. You know? So uh, let me take you uh, into this uh, presentation of mine. Uh, let, let us talk about faith. Faith from the from the perspective of Hinduism. Uh, so when we talk about faith, his Sharda is an important aspect of Hindu religious of duty and practice. So when we talk about faith, we are talking about faith in scriptures, faith in God, faith in the teacher, uh, faith in Dharma, the possibilities of liberation, and faith in the in inviolable laws of God. So when we talk about God, uh, G-O-D, uh, when, when, when we ask, even when I ask people, I mean, uh, who is God? They always say the superior, uh, the, the person, I mean, I mean they, they always have a lot of good things to say about. But in Hinduism, there's something called Tirumuti, which explain what God is. So, Brahma is the creator, he is basically the generator. Vishnu is the preserver, he operates us. And Lord Shiva is the destroyer. And that's where we die. So it's G-O-D. So this is something that in Hinduism it is there. And uh, it is, uh, maybe it is not understood or it is understood, I mean, and this is something that is uh, very weak uh, and uh, uh, many of us uh, are not aware about this, uh, but this is something that uh, in Tirumuti it explains that who God is, okay. The next one. So when we talk about Dharma, Dharma is basically ethics and duties the right effort, the right life, the right view, uh, what you want to do right. Okay. And the other one, uh, the next slide please, is uh, samsara, samsara. Samsara is rebirth. In Hindus, we believe in reincarnation. Uh, you come back seven times. And, and I mean, when we die, we're not sure we're going to come back. It all depends. Uh, on, on, the, on what we have done in this birth, if we have uh, karmas that we need to pay, we need to come back. Okay. And uh, Haley, the next one please Haley. And moksha. Moksha is death. 
liberation of the cycle of samsara. So it basically goes on dharma, samsara, and moksha. It goes on this. Okay. The uh, the next slide. So when we talk about signs, Hindus Hinduism is a religion very much associated with signs. Okay. So for example, when we talk about joining both palms together to greet namaskar, when I mean, you see people in India, um, people in Sri Lanka, they, they always uh, put their two palms together. It's a Hindu culture, people greet each other with by joining their palms. So why do they do this? Because when they join their palms and the fingers touch the points, uh, denotes pressure points of eyes, ears, and mind which allow us to remember the person for a long time. Okay. So Hinduism is very much uh, associated to science. Okay. The, the next one please. Uh, then Hindu woman wearing the toe rings. Okay. Uh, you can see some Hindu women wearing the toe ring. It is not, it's not just signify the woman is married. But what, is, what the toe ring is, they wear it on the second toe, which connects the uterus and passes to heart, and it will, strengthen, it will strengthen the uterus by regulating blood flow to it, and menstrual cycle will be regularized. So these are things that, I mean, yes, we have seen, uh, and when we ask, they always say that, oh, it is fashion, but we don't know what is behind it. Okay. Then we are talking about applying tilak on the forehead. You see that the Hindus they wear the, the red tilak on the forehead. Or we, they call it kungumam or the red dot. Uh, it is not Singapore uh, because Singapore is also always known as red dot. Okay, uh, it's applied in between the eyebrows. And it has a major nerve point in human body to prevent the loss of energy. So applying the kungumam, the point on the mid brow region is called Atnya Chakra, uh, automatically press, which facilitates, uh, facilitates blood supply to the face and muscle. So these are things that in Hinduism that we do. And the other one is Hindu woman wearing bangles, where the wrist is, is in constant activation of human body, pulse, pulse beat is at the wrist, and always checked from here, the pulse is always checked from the wrist. So bangles are worn at wrist in one's hand and is in constant friction, increases the blood circulation level. Furthermore, electricity passing out through the outer skin is again reverted to one's own because of the ring-shaped bangles, which has no end to pass the energy outside but it sends it back to the body. So this is the reason why uh, Hindu ladies, they, they wear bangles, a lot of bangles. And in Hinduism, we are basically vegetarian. I mean, I'm not vegetarian. So uh, why we are vegetarian? Because it stays. It says in uh, the Mahabharata, in Ramayana, in the Tirukkural, it says that we are not allowed to take another life because we have no power or energy to give life. Okay. So it says that how can he practice the true compassion who eats the flesh of an animal to fatten his own flesh. So we are not allowed to eat meat or fish or seafood, it's just vegetables. Okay. Uh, the next slide, Sally. So uh, in our vegetarian diet, you can see that uh, we have grains, we have uh, soya sauce, vegetables, fruits, nuts vegetable oil, dairy. I added the egg in because uh, this is where some Hindus still uh, argue and they say egg is still vegetarian. Okay. And we also have sweets. And uh, this is the staple diet uh, for our vegetarian uh, diet. This is how it, sh it should be. And uh, where it says that we must have 10 minutes of sunlight, uh, drink eight cups of water, uh, daily exercise and uh, this is what we have to eat okay, for uh, practicing Hindu. Okay? And we have temples. 
okay, Hindu temples. Now, the Hindu temple is built on scientific, uh, uh, what you call it, the, the scientific uh, principles, where they say the location and structure of the temple. Temples are found de uh, deliberately at a place where the positive energy is available, magnetic and electric wave. An idol of God is set to core center of the temple known as Mulastanam. So the idol is placed at this location and where the structure of the temple is built after the idol is placed. This is the correct way of doing it okay, because of the energy. Okay. And then we are talking about idol worship. So we propagate idol worship done to increase concentration during prayers where a man will shape his thoughts as per what he sees. If you have different objects in front of you, your thinking will change according to the object you are viewing. So basically, it is not that we are praying to some statue, it's just it is the, for the purpose of concentration. And when we say Hinduism is a way of life, is Hinduism basically derived from the Vedic, uh, Vedic uh, uh, culture. And uh, when we talked about uh, we have gods with ten hands and, and uh, we, 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 with different faces and this is all stories. These are all stories that were uh, Hinduism is basically a story. You know, it's a, it's a story where people believe and, and they move into it. Okay. So why do we ring bell when we enter into the temple? Uh, this is quite interesting because when I was young, I, I always ask, uh, why do you, why do we ring the bell when we enter into the temple? Uh, what I was told is because the gods are sleeping, so we need to ring the bell to wake them up. But in, in reality, uh, Hindus visiting temples would ring the bell where the main idol is placed. The bells are made in such a way that when they are produce a sound, it creates a unity in the left and right parts of our brain. The moment the bell is rung, it lasts for seven seconds in echo mode and it is enough to activate all the seven healing centers in our body. So when we lock, when we, uh, the next plus, uh, the next slide please. So when we talk about the seven healing, this one we're talking about spirituality, that, that is called the crown chakra. Then we talk the third eye chakra, awareness. Then we talk about the throat chakra, communication. Then we talk about the heart chakra, love and healing. Then we talk about solar plexus chakra, wisdom and power. And then we talk about the scaral chakra, sexuality and creativity and root chakra, basic trust. So Hindus believe in, in these uh, chakras and uh, the colors play an important uh, part. Okay. Next, uh, Haley. So uh, this is basically my short presentation on, on, on Hinduism. And uh, I would like to say that uh, artificial intelligence or robotic, uh, yes, we have, if you can look at this, you can see that uh, in a temple in India, they, they already have a robotic priest who is uh, doing the final prayer for, for Lord Ganesha. So when we talk about artificial intelligence here, yes, it is there, but I think that it cannot, uh, uh, it, it won't be able to take over uh, the place of a priest. Because if you look at this picture here, uh, it is no meaning. There is no meaning to it. So uh, this is my uh, conclusion. And uh, thank you very much. That's Sri, thank you. Uh, I think the two um, amazing insights in this amongst the many. One is you put things in context, uh, which was extremely important. And the second thing is the deep down explanations that you provided. I think that was welcome for those who are not knowledgeable about the subject matter. So Dr. Sri, thank you for providing context and explanation. I know I put a lot of pressure on you to put together um, a world-class deck in a short period of time. You came through, so thank you, actually. Thank you, thank you.
My pleasure. Our next speaker is Tuan, uh, is Haji Muhammad uh, Mazan. He's going to talk about artificial intelligence, faith, and science. This is my first opportunity to meet him. Uh, I've read about him and I've heard about him, and we are all anxious, especially myself, to hear um, his insights. Um, so, uh, Brother Mazan, the floor is yours. Where do you go? Where, I, where's uh, Mr. Mazan? Sorry, my apology. Can That's you okay. hear me? Sorry. Yes. yes. I, I, I was muted. That's yes, no, this why I didn't. <laughs> okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good okay. evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rusli Siddiqui, uh, for the introduction. And uh, indeed, uh, he said, I'm well honored. Uh, being able to participate in this forum. Uh, thank you to Dr. Sri Kumar, who actually invited me to be part of this. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 being uh, first, first and foremost, uh, I just uh, uh, introdu a brief introduction of myself. Uh, I, I think you not have seen my background, also my some my profile, but being in this. Uh, in the industry, hospitality industry in particular, and also culinary and uh, for more than four decades. So I think the subject that I'm going, going to touch on is about something to do with uh, uh, artificial intelligence, human, and uh, how, how is it the correlation in the doctrine of faith between all the interfaith in their uh, belief, uh, something to do with food, their intake, which is uh, their one most the important aspect of a life, uh, the food. Yeah. So what I'm going to touch on is actually uh, the human belief and the doctrine of faith in uh, food in Islam Islamic perspective. Uh, just a brief one. Uh, just I will touch on the uh, uh, trivia of food and faith, and also theology of food and the halal law food and the pro, uh, forbidden food. I think everybody uh, they know they know halal, but if we want to know the, why the Muslim has to be uh, has to be obligated to the uh, doctrine uh, of faith in Islam, where uh, they whatever they consume food or beverages has to be halal. Yeah. So just a brief description and explanation on this. And I also touch on the sadaqa, which is a voluntary offering of food in Islam. Uh, why it is encouraged uh, during the Feast of Ramadan, where, uh, where those Muslims, uh, they, they have to have a feeling uh, to uh, remember the, those poor and those unfortunate. And they are encouraged to uh, give a kind of uh, donation or charitable deeds to all these unfortunate people. Okay, um, I will, uh, the next slide. Okay, as this, as described, human belief and doctrine of faith, yeah? as described in the Holy Quran, chapter 46, Surah al hujra verses uh, 13, it says that, O mankind, you were created from a male and female and made you into races and tribes so that you may identify one another. Surely the noblest of you in Allah's sight is the one who is the most pious of you. Surely Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. Uh, this is a, a God created people uh, no, uh, uh, from various uh, races and tribes. Uh, the verses indicate that human being different races, being different tribes or color or whatever segmentation of genetic they belong to, they has a different way of life, certainly. Uh, different culture and also different tradition. tradition and different belief, yeah? So each of them here, they on, has their own doctrine or codification of belief or a body of teaching. Uh, that the doctrine means a, a, a codification of beliefs yeah? and a body of teaching or instruction. When come to food, the belief and the appreciation may differ from each other. Yeah? Even uh, when they uh, offer their prayers before they consume the food, so the, the Christianity have different way of actually appreciation and uh, ri ritual, reciting the rit uh, ri ritual differently as opposed to Islam and other faith as well. Yeah. Okay. The belief and the appreciation may differ from each other doctrine. May it be the sources, the way of it being offered and consumed. All right. My next slide. Okay. 
Okay, sorry. So what does you mean by trivia of food and faith? I mean, uh, trivia means actually uh, the uh, information, just a, just a brief data. So food is a gift of God given to all creature for the purpose of life natures. Okay, uh, sharing and celebration when it is done in the name of God. I mean, uh, all what, regardless of what faith we are, actually, what <coughs> the believers yeah, uh, still believe. Uh, water, stuck in uh, then, sorry, okay. Um, the, the, uh, it means that uh, uh, we, regardless what faith, are actually, what, uh, the believers uh, believe that. The, all the food is being created by God for the human consumption and all the living creatures. Okay, and then theology of food as human need in accordance to faith. Before I come to the subject of uh, the uh, uh, doctrine of faith in Islamic perspective, so sorry, uh, the previous one. Okay, uh, they, okay, the believers of any kind of faith hold to it, believe that all. Of our food is an extension of creation by Almighty, by the God. Uh, we were given to have dominion over His other living creature. Therefore, decision what we eat and how that food get to us are expression of a scarce duty. I mean, uh, we hold to the principle that whatever we have, whatever we have uh, to consume is actually the creation, uh, the creation of God. Yeah, all right. So the next slide. Okay, sorry. Therefore, uh, what I want to highlight here from Islamic belief, beholding to our guidance of our holy book. This is the final revelation of the book, which is Al Quran Karim, and the Sunnah of our holy prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Peace be upon peace be upon him, as narrated in the Hadith. Hadith is the tradition and practices of our of our holy prophet. So, so food consumed by followers of Islam. The Muslim must be halal. So, what is halal? Uh, I mean, everybody no halal. I mean, you are forbidden from eating pork. You are you are not supposed to consume those alcoholic beverages. They actually they are more than that that we need to understand. Nevertheless, uh, what I'm going to explain here, halal means halal means lawful. It pertains to what Muslim can do, especially in regards to food and drink. The opposite of halal is haram, which which carries the meaning forbidden. I mean, you mean you are not allowed yeah, to consume. Al-Quran set out what constitutes halal and is reflected in our Sharia law. Sharia laws govern, uh, govern every aspect of life of Muslim and is sourced from Al-Quran and the Sunnah, which is Hadith. The doctrine of faith in relation to in relation of food, Allah has forbidden Muslim to eat animal that does not die as a result of man I mean, um, as a man, meaning, I mean, it has to be slaughtered by a man. And food that contains blood or swine, which is actually a pig, or food has been sacrificed to another god, as described in our Holy Quran, chapter 2, uh, chapter 2, uh, Surah Al Baqarah, uh, meaning Baqarah means cow, eh? verses uh, 173, uh, saying that, uh, okay, sorry, the next one, uh, which actually uh, mentioned. Uh, what is permissible for the Muslim to consume. Okay. In the context of dietary rule, pork and blood, as well as meat from bird of prey, a bird which actually kill another uh, a living uh, creature uh, for their consumption, huh? that, is what, that is what we call bird of prey, and reptile are defined as haram. So it's forbidden for Muslim to consume the meat of uh, this type of living creature. Allah also decreed that Animal must not have died as a result of being killed by strangulation, by violent blow, and animal attacked by other animals unless man has able to kill it. Meaning, if the, the if the animal if the uh, what you call it um, uh, chicken or something has been attacked by another animal, but uh, while is uh, the man is able to slaughter it, then it's permissible to consume. This is, is a uh, say it in the chapter 5, verses 31, Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayat 30, 31. Similarly, Allah forbid Muslim to consume alcohol. Yeah. So apart from this very short list of restrictions for Muslim, so Muslim consume almost everything. Actually. 
Uh, but of of course, there, there is a guideline which I actually forbid it. Uh, what other thing you know you can consume and not uh, not consume not to consume? Okay, food meat from animal need to be slaughtered the Islamic ways. Okay, and then uh, we touch on halal ways of uh, uh, slaughtering. The Islamic method of killing animal for meat is called zabiha. It must be alive. It must be alive at the time of slaughter. Animal not killed by ritual slaughter are considered carry on meat, or in Malay they call it bangkai. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, it is not been slaughtered, so it's uh, you're not supposed to eat. Yeah. So the accusation saying that Islamic ritual slaughter is uh, as cruel is not actually the method is actually uh, more uh, human, uh, human. Yeah? Uh, it is uh, it's not that cruel. It's not cruel as per se. Okay, regardless what faith or belief you belong to, prayers or reciting of ritual verses before eating is a spiritual mandatory. Uh, be it Hinduism, Ju uh, Judaism, or even Christianity, or you are actually there is a you will recite or some uh, ritual verses before you eat. Okay, the ultimate purpose is to seek God blessing and confession of thank food. The thanksgiving is the power that transforms desire and satisfaction, love, possession into life that fulfill everything in the world given to us is by God. I mean, in the Islam perspective, is by Allah. Allah decreed that ritual mention his name before consuming. It described in Al-Quran, chapter 6, verses 118, Surah Al-An'am, ayat 118. In the same chapter, chapter 6, verses, uh, verses 119, affirm. The need to say Allah's name, meaning you say Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, which means in the name of Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful. This is the, this is the list. There are other ritual verses which are some uh, 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 being practiced in Islam, but at least uh, it, it will be mentioned uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim before uh, the performing of slaughtering. Okay. The next one. Okay. Okay, and then another thing, what we want to touch on in on the sadaka. I mean, uh, the some charitable uh, work, a charitable deed uh, by the, the believers of Islam, the Muslim, and Islam encourage charitable deeds, donation, and extension, offering to poor, and the unfortunates. A firm belief that possession of our food is not solely belong to us. Huh? It's not. It's not solely belong to us. Some are meant for the poor and those suffering. As such, Muslims perform this good deed by offering food for the needy. This said, these charitable practices are common among Muslims, particularly during the fasting month of the holy, holy month of Ramadan. Fasting, it in its uh, most fundamental aspiration, is about developing a sacrificial, self-offering life that addresses and nurtures the needs of others. In this great month of blessing, Allah specifically emphasizes Muslims should show their mercy by feeling the suffering of those unfortunate ummah. Islam encourages Muslims to feed the fasting in Ramadan to the level that we will get reward. It was narrated by Ziyad ibn Khalid al-Juhani. Said the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, said, Whoever give iftar, I mean, whoever give uh, the breakfasting meal, to one who is fasting will have a reward like this without that detracting from the reward of the fasting person in the slightest. Thus, seeking Allah's blessing and rewards. All right. Okay, with that, I conclude uh, my presentation. Just a brief one. Uh, I would say thank you to all the speakers uh, that uh, who has presented earlier. It's indeed uh, I'm very grateful to be invited to participate. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you, uh, Brother Muhammad. Um, three things that were takeaways for all of us. You talked about the permissibility, the prohibited, and the process. And then you basically said, here are the sources. So uh, there's transparency and governance. Um, and I think one of the more important takeaways for me from your presentation was all faiths, all ways of life invoke God's name before they eat. And I think that's really important for all of us to remember. So thank you. Um, what's also interesting is the development right now is on sustainability and climate change and food is a big contributor 
to the climate change. Uh, according to data, about 25% of global greenhouse gases are coming from the agriculture food sector. Dr. So Rosie, we, uh, may I interrupt uh, just a moment? I, I, uh, I have forgotten to highlight on the artificial intelligence. Of course, uh, robot cannot replace man in the slaughtering all this. Yeah? Right, right. Yeah. No, no, thank yeah. you. No, that's important. Uh, there's discussion. So the carbon footprint of a faith. Dr. Sri talked about um, Hinduism espousing plant-based diet. If you look at the literature and data, that has the lowest carbon footprint, and that's important. The Muslims, um, we have a more protein-based diet, so we have a higher carbon footprint. These are the things that we need to think about of finding balances. So thank you, Brother Muhammad. Thank Our next speaker. And I'm looking forward to uh, listening uh, is Ms. Jaga Tiswari Sitaraman, and she is going to uh, talk about NLP and, and Hinduism. I think it's um, a fascinating topic, and I am looking forward um, to learning as we all are. So, uh, Ms. Rahman, the podium is yours. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Rushdi, for inviting, as well as uh, Mr. Sivar, uh, Mr. Sri, actually, who actually invited me here. Okay, I'd like to share. Can I share one slide of here? Can you give me a... Okay, great. I think the slide's quite late. Okay, never mind. I'll just uh, remove my slides. I'll just talk on this. I think something wrong with the slide here. Okay. Okay, sorry about it. That's okay. Take your time. That's okay. Take your time. Natural language processing. Um, as, as we wait, I assume that NLP means natural language processing. Is that correct? No, neural linguistic programming. Okay, um, thank you. Um, um, please. Okay. Uh, In a minute. Let's mm -hmm. do the stop sharing first. Okay. It really can be seen the slide here. There's only one slide here. Yes, please proceed. Okay. Something wrong with the slide. I'm, 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 I'm sorry about it. I think something wrong with the slide. Okay, maybe you can get back the slide back again. So I'm just uh, on the spot here. Yeah, it's uh, well, okay. 
Okay, let's come back on the topic of NLP here. Okay, NLP actually um, under the perceptions of uh, uh, transmission on the, what we call it, Indism. So how this relates to that? So before we go into that, uh, I would like to share first uh, what is all about uh, NLP and as well as how it relates to uh, what we call it under the called uh, NLP. Okay, so just give me one minute. Okay, the perceptives of uh, NLP where it is actually uh, transforming uh, communication and Hinduism. So before that, let me introduce myself. Okay, my name is Ajagadi Swari and uh, you can call me as uh, Arul Larasi as well. Uh, as uh, I'm an NLP uh, basic uh, practitioner as well, an NLP basic practitioner. Okay, where this actually comes into my mind, where this Hinduism and also the NLP, there's a few things that actually trigger me a lot here where I, when I was going through, because when I was doing my meditations, all that. So the transforming communication actually is, is an cooperative relatives, uh, which is based largely on NLP. Okay, NLP is actually Neuro Linguistic Programming. So this is actually a very enthusiastic uh, about sharing my transformation communication with people around the world. And I have found it usually to offer people some culture and the religions, uh, perspectives, some links as well as uh, in the field of NLP. Okay, at their own models of the world. Okay, this particular is actually, I trust and I believe and I use school for the people. Okay, but all the races here, I mean, I believe that all are here is in Malaysians and also globally, where there's a lot of a religious uh, which is involved here, okay? So there's a lot of, uh, what we call it, a lot of religious, they have uh, their beliefs as well. And for me, I would like to share on the Hinduism. Okay, there's in Hinduism, there's a quite a lot that we call it under Dharma, Karma, and Satya, Graha. Okay. According to the research that uh, under the sociology, where one of the Dr. Badrinath Rao, which actually stated, Okay, he is actually, uh, he used of the Hinduism perspective in a conflict of the resolution. Okay, he also mentioned that the world needs to find a new mechanism to enable people to solve conflicts. Okay, so this actually used a religion uh, in one attempt at uh, identifying a new approach. Okay, in India, it's one of the most diverse society in the world and as a culture has to deal with these issues more than other societies. Okay, when my interest actually emerged uh, in from the recurrent and also the base conflicts going on, actually, uh, when it's uh, because in India, there's a lot of Indians as well compared to Malaysia. When I was going through all this, when I came into the Hinduism, where there's a lot of Vedas and all this comes in, I will share about it a bit on that as well sooner. And a great group that em encompass conflict in general, and in particular conflict of the real uh, resolutions, and also the alternative or dispute of the resolution. Okay, dharma. Actually, when I was discussing about that earlier, dharma. Okay, dharma actually involves the moral order, acting in ways that are right for one's own life path, because everybody do have their own path where. Uh, Everybody have their own beliefs, and this is the individual. Okay, that's mean what we call it as that everybody have their own choice. Okay, karma is a principle which emphasizes the of the consequence of one's action. So what we call it is it's encourage tolerance and as well as non-violence as well. Okay, this is what we call as a karma. Okay, another part is we call it as a satyagraha means the force of the truth rather than cohesive. This analyzes this application of the individuals of the religious traditions in a conflict of the resolutions as well. So during that uh, suggestions as well, what happened that the relativism of the Dharma supports both tradition and as well as modernity, innovations and also conformity. So what we call it, the concept of a dharma as entrenched ethical relativism 
in the Hinduism way of thinking that we are using now. So in a Hindu model of the following one's karma, what a person should and should not do depends on the context of the situation. That is where some of the NLP comes in as well, because this is neuro-linguistic programming, where it's programmed in our mind. It's actually considered mind, uh, uh, body and soul. Okay. So one real uh, results of such a uh, context based okay contact based approach he suggested okay mr rao which is suggested that the truth is relative and ultimate truth is unknowable so nobody knows the truth okay and that is no choice but to be tolerant to the truth of the others so different culture prefer either contact free or contact sensitive rules in their thought of the processing. So one of it is actually Hinduism tend to operate on the context sensitivity. So the relative, the relativism of the truth is the fundamental principle of NLP, which sums it up to the phrase of the map is not the territory. That is the main thing that we always say that the map is not the territory. So the map is only a guide. The territory is the destination. So so it's the map that actually brings it, but it's not the territory. So people tend to have that different uh, perceptions and uh, during this actually more in the sensitive way. But this actually comes, what is that? Very simple as that it's called as a, the map is not the territory. That is on the first part. On the second part is Dharma and also destiny. Okay, does this Hindu concept of Dharma inevitable means that each person's life uh, predetermined by their past karma, teachers or schools or you know any uh, anywhere that we learn actually the teachers such as like what we call it the Mahatma Gandhi is one of our teacher where have challenged this interpretation of the Hindu scriptures. So the Hindu book of yoga, okay, there's a one book of the yoga vashta, yoga vashta is emphasized on that. There's a nothing like a destiny other than the effect of the previous fact. Okay. And the man determine his own destiny by his own thought. So the thought has to be uh, to be the, the best, what we call it for each and every, where they think that it is have to be the best for them, for the future. So he can make those things as also has happened, which were not designed to happen. Okay. So, and it, it's also another book that we can actually share uh, that is from the Sivananda, Swami Sivananda in the year of 1995. And I have taken this page as a 108 where the Mahatma Gandhi, for example, took and the seamless impossibility of the task of defining the word, the largest emphasize, emphasizing of the resting is the biggest colony away. So he clearly believed that his destiny was his own way and his destiny is his own hand. So and nobody can change from anybody that everybody who have their own uh, destiny is their own hand. Okay. So in the in this actually in this course that he actually mentioned, okay, written by him, but by a person limited in the English, the letter says, men are born naked. It's like simple word. Okay, so everyone is a clear and, you know, is everyone has to be designed by themselves. But to them, two hands are given. So we think God has given paradise open a man, but he has not given it directly open a man. So this is what, what the God thinks. Okay, he has given it indirectly open them by giving two hands. So the power to create any and everything to make a paradise itself in the present of the world. So that is what we call it as a dharma and destiny. So on the karma and the system of the thinking, okay, this is another part of it, that the karma and the system of the thinking, the law of karma is what NLP would call a system of the model of life. So that is where this comes, Hinduism and also and Hinduism and also the NLP here. So the law of the karma is what NLP would call a system model of life. So it's the system of the model of the life. The second fundamental principle of NLP is that the world is the best understood 
as made up of an interaction system rather than uh, rather than discrediting the karmas. That is, we call it as a action as as well as a consequences. It drives us to ever ever more karmas, which created a cycle of suffering. So what we call it as a pain or pleasure. That's another terms will comes as a pain or pleasure. This suffers keeps us hoping that she or he can and have the first part of the action. Says like a, what we call is a gorging her or himself with the too much of food. Without the second part, we says that she, uh, says that feeling overfull or becoming or best. Okay, this is what we call it one of it that suffers comes in whether it's a pain or pleasure. Okay, to use this uh, what we call subtle of the example, we keep hoping that. We can be dishonest in a business transaction where we keep hoping that we can be dishonest. Okay, as well as a transaction without it affecting our self-respect. So that is very important as well. So that we can secretly have an you know altering of the our marriage as well. So, but as an Indian, okay, as an Indian, cause and effects are inseparated in the case of the effect. So that is what we call it here. So life is always a system. Westerns interprets is a law of karma. Okay. So as the individualism, what we call it as a, it is actually a called as a um, the concept. There is no concept of punishment involved. Uh, punishment involved. In fact, like a teacher of a karma point out that the sad thing is that it's not so called. It's so called as an evil action of themselves to result of a misfortune. So they of they could hardly deserve some divine punishment, okay, from the consequences that affect them. So we know, for example, that the more violence someone is subjected to in the childhood, the more likely they are to be violent themselves as an adult. So during my class, when I was attended this NLP, we had some exercise that we went through, and it really goes into our mind. Where it goes to, where is our childhood? Huh? So it's like uh, the NLP comes in where we need to go and clear it off. Where we call it as a, one of options is the karma. So where is it? So we need to find out that. So should the universe punish people for their fortune? There's a one explanation actually from Swami Sivananda. I always like to read his books actually. Sivananda explained that why does one man possess a good moral character? So what does another poses an evil character? What is the two different meanings of it? So these things can be easily explained by the law of action and as well as the reaction. So nobody is to be blamed. Okay, example, nobody is to be blamed. This shift is actually from the uh, from the blame frame to the system based of understanding is centered in the both NLP and as well as the, the effective conflict of the revolution. So how does this one act, uh, that is what everyone used to ask, okay, how does this one act, knowing that all the things are interrelated in this way, so one of the Mahatma Gandhi who considered himself first and foremost a karma yogi, who is called as a practitioner of the path of the action. So it is explained the application of the system model using the core uh, Hindu scriptures that the Bhagavad Gita comes in. Okay, the Gita says, do your allotted work, but, but uh, it is fruitful. So that means you can do whatever you want, but it has to be from your passion, whatever that you like. Okay, that to be detached or it has to be work or whatever. And no desire for reward or the work. So we can't be thinking that what are we doing it and it has to return with the reward. Okay, but the reward has to be remuneration of the fruit is no way means indifferent to the results. So that is what it means. It means, uh, so in the regards of every action, okay, every action, one must know the results that is expected to follow, the mean, therefore, and the capacity of it. Okay, that's actually for today that I would like to share. And I think this is, uh, actually, this is a very interesting topic, NLP with the Hinduism as well. Okay, so... Thank you for the talk today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity for the talk today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
interesting insights on dharma and karma. And there are a couple of uh, points that you mentioned that I wanted to repeat. Um, context and sensitivity, tolerant to the truth of others, um, mapping and territory. So I think these are incredibly important points uh, that shows that we have more things in common amongst the faiths than there are differences. So thank you very much. And, and our next speaker is uh, someone we had the pleasure of hearing um, many months ago on an event in Port Dixon, I believe. Um, his name is Brother Azmi bin Abdul Khalid, and um, he's a deep thinker uh, from what I remember in his uh, um, initial presentation. And he's going to talk about technology, humanity, and beliefs. So uh, Brother Khalid, uh, the podium is yours. Thank you, Brother Zadiki. Am I visible? Can I be seen? Can I be heard? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> firstly, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh to everybody. Um, I don't know how I agreed to say yes to Dr. Sri to become one of the panelists tonight because this is such a huge area of concern and um, belief. But I decided to take up the challenge simply because I've been thinking about certain aspects of these three dimensions uh, which are linked tonight. But I would like to focus on very general thoughts about um, what is technology, how is it linked to humanity and how does it affect beliefs? I think uh, all, this, all the panelists before me uh, have touched on very important aspects in their own rights. Firstly, I would like to um, apologize that I do not have any like, uh, slides because um, I find it very difficult to connect the dots between these three elements. Anyway, to me, technology, up to this point in my life, I regard it as an enabler. Technology enables many things. And the enabler called technology is created by man. And uh, man is created by, for us believers, by God. So immediately we can see the connection there that, you know, uh, if there is divine intervention in everything that we do, then it is not a surprise to find that technology is not really difficult to grapple with. Um, I remember a simple definition of technology has been categorized into two very simple um, parts. Number one is the, um, that the understanding of technology to be like uh, interventionalist, meaning that you use technology, we use technology to intervene in certain things that we, uh, we do in life. For example, inside the lab, uh, we've got a group of scientists trying to start from the means to arrive at the end. So they, they, they improvise on a lot of things, but they cannot say that by the time they reach the end, the experiment has ended because this is, uh, according to them, it has ended. But then again, according to the universe, in terms of the practitioners of science and technology, maybe it is not ending. And maybe it is still forging ahead. So there is this element of scaling that we uh, always have in life. That is, we start from, from a very small figment of imagination to what we think that we have already expanded in terms of our, our uh, beliefs and our importance in life. Uh, but yet, that has got to be qualified by other people. So what I'm trying to say in short is that the simple definition of technology is that it is the means to an end. Uh, I'm not saying that this is my definition. I'm trying to collate the various definitional uh, aspects that I have been exposed to in a very limited sense compared to other uh, profound thinkers. Number two is that uh, the way technology moves is that it is also a cultural dimension. And this is something which I find very fascinating. Why is it cultural? It is cultural simply because um, we always relate technology to science, like science and technology, 
and uh, technological aspects of scientific discoveries and the marriage between science and technology will create convenience, ease, and also improvements in our lives. Um, I won't dispute that. I would agree with it. But then again, um, there is also a dimension in, in, in technology which is very cultural in nature. A simple definition of cultural in nature of technology is that we use technology simply because our lives depend on it when we need it. For example, like, uh, uh, we can use the, the repetitive example of a mobile phone, but I would like to go beyond that. And uh, for example, now we are moving towards uh, electric cars using batteries and so forth. Not many of us uh, are very conversant in the subject, but basically what it means is that it is not actually a 100% scientific or technological discovery. It is now altering our cultural perspective about ourselves, about how we relate to the world. You know, what we, we depended on fossil fuel, and now fossil fuel uh, are becoming very scarce and it is polluting the world. Uh, coincidentally, the COP26 in, uh, in, in, in Glasgow uh, is ongoing, I think, last day or last two days. Uh, because of this, this, this dependence on fossil fuel. Now, it is cultural in that sense. Cultural because the societal impact at the end of the day is tremendous. And we cannot, there is no measurement that I know so far of how to measure the cultural impact of technology. Now I move on to uh, humanity. I've always been fascinated by this idea that, you know, how can, how can uh, technology affect humanity? I think technology affects humanity in so many ways, according to the extent of our thinking. Um, to me, humanity should be very wary about technology, always. And uh, I've always argued with my friends that I am not a firm believer of 100% dependence on things like, you know, even artificial intelligence or even on some other things like robotics, or some other things like deep, deep or machine learning. I'm not trying to say that they are not important, but I would like to argue upon the fact that, you know, uh, we are so dependent on creating new ideas about aspects of technology, which we call artificial intelligence and, and other parts of it. To the extent that we forget that, you know, at the end of the day, it is the natural intelligence that dictates the creation of artificial intelligence. And that is a demonstration of our, of our belief, which, which, which connects me to my third aspect of tonight's uh, short talk. And, and that belief is very important because without the belief in the maker, the divine creator, you know, whatever religion that practices that we belong to, there is no point to talking about about anything tonight, because he is the one who makes us come together tonight. He is the one who inspires us to talk with, with each other as, uh, as panelists and also as uh, other listeners in this webinar tonight. So, so the, the connection between the three, that is technology, humanity, and beliefs, are very, very strong. But at the end of the day, uh, even after we have died, we do not know when. The, the, the belief will still go on, but the technology will change tremendously. I do not know what is the world going to look like 21st, 22nd, 23rd century until the world uh, is no more. Or, and then humanity will remain, but it will be in different shapes and forms. So I would like to end tonight's talk by posing this question to myself and to all of us, that is, uh, we are very, very dependent on technology. So that to the extent that technology now almost dictates our life. But some people say that, you know, what alternatives do you have? I think the alter alternatives are many, but uh, it is up to us to choose. I have got one few friends who have thrown away their handphones. They say that it is a nuisance in their lives. And now, I ask them, how do you communicate them? He says that communication can be done in many forms. 
you know, uh, you can still use your landlines to talk to each other, or you can still go to that person's uh, place without any notice, which is very rude. But then again, we, we, we live in very difficult and challenging times. So I would like to end my, 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 my very brief sharing of thoughts tonight by ending this, this talk uh, to, to say that artificial intelligence is part of technology. Technology is part of humanity. And humanity is dictated by beliefs. And belief is centering around the maker. And in our case, it is God. So thank you very much and assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Brother Khalid. Um, um, deep insights, um, well done without PowerPoint slides. It's difficult um, to um, tell a story, but uh, you've done a masterful job. A couple of points that I wanted to highlight that I thought were extremely pertinent in what you've said. One, about technology being an enabler where technology is created by man and God creates man. So there's a lot of implications in terms of what you've said. The second is technology has a cultural dimensions. Again, that is an event for itself uh, going forward because that has a lot of influence on the development of the technology, the pace of traction of technology in, in the geography. So I think um, culture does have an impact. And the uh, last part that you ended on is dependency. Uh, do we need to de-link from uh, technology because there was life before the internet, there was life before the smartphones and the experiment that many people are doing of putting down their handphones and de-linking from social media has brought them from being on 24 seven to having their life back. So extremely important points um, for us to think about and ponder. So thank you. Our next speaker um, is Ms. Uh, Hakima um, Rosana, and she's going to talk about new life challenges. Truth be told, one of the sparks for this event was an event that she led several years ago. I was informed by uh, by a colleague about the event and I thought it was fascinating. And so um, we're very fortunate to have her uh, to uh, come and speak and on the topic of uh, new life challenges. So Sister Hakima, uh, the podium is yours. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I want to thank Dr. Rushdi for organizing this conference and I'm truly honored for this opportunity. Also, a personal thank you uh, to Dr. Muti Siddiqui for sharing such an enlightening insight earlier this evening. Wow. Um, this is Hakima practicing Ibn Sina medicine. Our understanding of healing is not limited to the body, but it is inclusive of the heart and soul. According to Ibn Qayyum al jawziyah healing is not just about consuming medicine, but it is a way of life where you have a relationship with yourself with God and with nature. So what I would like to share today is the root cause of all problems that we are facing in the modern world today with the hope that it will raise not just mere awareness but affirmative action in resolving the issues right down to its roots. As I'm only given 15 minutes to speak on this topic, New Life Challenge, obviously this is not a short topic to speak on, especially in this era of pandemic, which is slowly turning into an era of endemic on top of it being the end of times or the age of fitna. So within this 15 minutes, I'm only able to skim through the surface of the topic very quickly. More than six decades since World War II, three to four generations of people have been raised through the modern education system. When you cut the crap out of the word modern, you will find that the word modern has been coined as a facade to the term godless. The godless education system has successfully divorced our psyche and awareness from the presence of God. While you and I may lie to ourselves into thinking that we are believers of God as we perform our godly rituals and duties, we are far from being believers. We are just ritualistic out of our sense of duty. We don't really believe in God as our faith is in science and technology and that precedes our faith in God and religion. 
a simple analogy of this is no diabetic Muslim will feed on honey as a cure for their ailment. Although in the chapter of Anah or the bees, verse 69, God clearly states, translated into English, there emerges from the bellies of bees a drink varying in colors in which there is healing for people. Indeed, in that is a sign for people who think. So based on this example, it is clear that God or the prophet of God can say anything in any context, but as long as modern scientific research does not agree with it, no educated Muslim has the courage to follow God's word or the prophet's sayings. The impact of the first generation of people who were successfully minted by the modern godless education system may not be as, detri as detrimental as it was on the second generation. But coming down to living with the third and fourth generation, generally we as a community of the world have drowned into a soulless, mindless generation of humans, devoid of beingness and innate intelligence. Thus, we are unable to achieve the human potential endowed by God. As soulless, mindless humans, we live with an eye devoid of sight, with ears devoid of hearing, with a heart devoid of feeling. We have become the generation of people that Allah has referred to in the chapter 2, verse 18 of the Quran. They are deaf, dumb, and blind, so they return not to the right path. As our psyche is divorced from God consciousness, layers of our souls become damaged and its power is weakened as it enters the human body. The weakness of the soul, the weakness of the soul, the weakness of the power of the soul shrinks the size of our hearts. The DNA strands begin to break up and millions of cells within our bodies die as a result of that. Further, as a result, we're unable to tap into our inner senses. Thus, we evolve by devoting our focus and attention onto an external worldly life and adopt more and more atheistic beliefs, such as I only believe in what I can see. I do not believe in what I do not see. In facing life challenges, we wander around seeking for solution outside of ourselves. Solutions made available to us are only the ones which are profitable to economic vultures, unfortunately. Best marketers in the world today continuously conduct study after study on how you think and behave so that they may know how to make you do what they want you to do. And why do they do that? So that they may sell us crap that we do not need, make us more and more sick, convince us, convince us that drugs are medicine make us poor and fail in life so that we may continue our dependence and continue being their slaves, which they name as consumers. Yet hindsight, you and me, we are unable to tell the difference between glass and diamond, between true, truth and false. So we waste our valuable youthful life on this godless system of economy, which is called consumerism. While Islam is never against science, technology in any form, including artificial intelligence. However, Islam is against slavery in any shape and form. And today it is obvious that technology is being advanced to control and manipulate human beings further and further. Halfway through life, when most people realize the flaw of the modern godless system, when they begin to experience intolerable amount of stress and anxiety until depression sets in and wins the trophy of second place among all chronic illnesses in developing countries. And heart disease tops as the major killer in every country around the world for more than six decades, in spite of the billions of dollars spent on cardiology research with no obvious solution. Upon realizing the flaw of the system, People are still too busy wheeling the treadmill of life like hamsters and wheels. People are too overwhelmed in fear and exhaustion to sit down and think their life through. The inertia of life is going, going, going. And if they take a break from running the hamster wheel, they possess deep fear of failure. 
and they are afraid that others may judge them for being different. Fear of humans, fear of materialism is the fuel that keeps us all wheeling and peddling. Imagine since your whole life you have been taught the goal of life is to make the most amount of money. All your academic life going through school is not for the sake of Allah, but for the sake of possessing lots of money someday. And your career and business goals are all for the sake of making money, not for the sake of God. So all you have, all you get is stress, anxiety, depression, relationship problems, and eventually heart failure. So it doesn't seem like we've all received the price for our hard labor. To break out of the status quo takes tremendous amount of energy, foresight, and most importantly, God consciousness. Truly, transformation takes place only in the realm of God consciousness, so that our soul may be activated to a level where we drive through life on the level of the soul instead of the level of the body. Imagine how God consciousness fuels the soul. The power of the soul is activated beyond the realm of this world. We experience the speed of light and Muslims should achieve success beyond their short span of lives. As they did during the golden era of Islam. Obviously, the darkness of stress and depression will be extinguished by the light of God. You may automatically experience peace, tranquility, and happiness. You will become contented and satisfied with God's endowment in your life. If we're willing to be honest, how much of all our conferences and debates around the world are giving people the insight and foresight to break out of the godless animalistic system, providing a spiritually scientific process of how full submission to God and living on a God conscious level may enlighten our lives for the limitations of the body to experience the unlimited potential of the soul. Unlimited potential of the soul. Transform, transforming our lives to live on the soul level, experiencing the speed of light and transforming our, transforming our personal lives, our community and the world. This is the magic of Islam. Why do we adopt the faith of Islam if we're unable to experience the power of God in, him, in ourselves, in our community? As men were created as the best of creation. If how we experience ourselves is the same as those who do not adopt the faith of Islam, what good is the faith of Islam to us? What good is the faith of Islam to us? Some Islamic universities thread on this endeavor through a half-baked process called Islamization of knowledge. And what they do is paste the Islamic text onto secular framework to provide the secular frame, to prove the secular framework is true and is, in, and is in alignment to Islam. How such atrocity is accepted by renowned scholars worldwide is truly a puzzle, as this act is helping to prove how right Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection really is. Did the universe just evolve from nothing into thin, thin air? Did it really? This absurd approach is utterly ridiculous, as knowledge which stems from God as being the creator of the universe versus absolute denial of the existence of God clearly are two opposite sides of the pole. When my great grandfather Hafiz Ghulam Sarwa of Pakistan origin translated the Holy Quran into English, he was attempting to fight the fitna from Orientalists on Islam to cleanse the name of Islam from being misunderstood by non-Muslims. But in this day and age, we are struggling to cleanse misunderstanding on the pillars of faith to Muslims. In reality, man is his soul, not his body. 
and the soul depends on God consciousness for its survival, just as the body gasps for air to survive. Without God consciousness, the soul is ruined and emotions experience utter panic causing damage to the structure of DNA strands and millions of cells die. The cause and effect cycle is referred to in Islam as qada and qadar. Within the Islamic text, they explain the cause and effect and it is well understood. Therefore, life can be easily managed for the creation of success. However, in this era, we do not understand cause and effect or the qada and qadar. We do not understand how to control our lives for success as we are oblivious of God's formula of cause and effect or qadar and qadar, we are at a loss as we are unaware of the GPS for steering our wheels towards everlasting success. New life challenge. This is the new life challenge. This is the challenge that we all have to go through to transform our lives. We need to move out of this body. We need to move out of this material form and return back to our spiritual form and return back our focus to the inner dimension of our soul so that we may meet with God. So that we may have the sixth sense that is innate within all of us. That is my sharing for today. I thank you all um, for your attention and um, for, for being here with me tonight. Thank you very, very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam, Sister Hakima. Thank you very much for your um, spirited um, insights. I think there are some very interesting takeaways. And I think the essence, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is delinking from the beliefs of what we can see, delinking from consumerism, delinking where, where possible, when possible from technology, which may manipulate, which may create fear, which may cause stress, uh, which causes the degradation of the human body and focusing in on the soul because the soul is connected to God consciousness. Hopefully I captured uh, in summarized form what you just said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker um, is uh, Mr. Mel Abispo, and uh, he is going to be speaking to us um, on uh, the well, uh, sorry, I didn't get the topic. Um, my apologies, uh, Brother Mel. Please uh, uh, introduce yourself because you have a, a long and rich history of, of doing innovative work. And also um, the, the the topic, obviously, it's linked to artificial intelligence, faith, and science. So right. over to you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you for inviting me to, um, in this um conference and I really learned a lot especially from the last speaker who is very passionate about her religion um, sharing all these interesting um, um, enlightenments I was asked to talk about my religion I am from the Philippines and um, I'm a Roman Catholic or a Catholic uh, which is uh, the largest religion in the world with 1.3 billion followers the Philippines is the largest Catholic country in Asia. We are also one of the largest Catholic countries in the world. The Catholic religion is so straightforward and simple. We don't have too many restrictions. We do not have food restriction, restrictions such as those for Muslims, which is halal, or the kosher for Jews, or vegetarian for Hinduism. We basically eat everything. We follow very simple religious practices. We go to church every Sunday. We follow the moral values taught to us uh, from the Bible, which is our holy scripture. We have 
very simple celebrations. We have a week-long prayer, which is called as Holy Week. We celebrate Christmas as we recognize this as the birth of our um, of Jesus Christ, the Son of our uh, Heavenly Father. The Catholic religion is a very simple religion. And Filipinos are very devout Catholics. But our faith was, um, was challenged during the pandemic. We went through, very, as all of us went through very difficult situations during the pandemic. It tested our faith. It tested our belief that um, God would, would protect us from this pandemic. But then Filipinos are resilient. Filipinas are devout Catholics. We continued believing that there is God that protects us, that guides us. We continued going to church through technology, uh, by by um, uh, by online masses. And as, as as I speak now, the Philippines has gone back to normalcy. Um, we lifted all the restrictions. We went back to doing our normal lives. And the church has reopened its door, doors for, for the followers and the, the faithful. On the topic about science and religion, it is a taboo for us to compare religion and science as there are many conflicting practices and teaching in the Catholic religion um, with, with science. And for us, I personally believe that it would be impossible for robots to take over the position of um, the priest in our religion. As if you are not aware, um, when we hold our masses, we put on so much emotion in the, the words of God, in our prayers, and a robot cannot communicate that emotion. Robots cannot share that emotion so technology will have certain place in my religion but it would never replace the main functions of the priest i think that ends my my talk about my religion which is the catholic practice thank you to all of you and good night Mel, thank you um a very powerful presentation um you basically highlighted some very important points if you'll allow me to summarize um, one, uh, the Roman Catholic uh, religion is a simple religion, and that, it's, and that is its beauty, because it leads to understanding, and understanding leads to loyalty. So I thought that was very well said. The second part was ro robots and priests. There was actually an article in one of the mainstream uh, papers where they talked about robotics and how it could basically replace priests, rabbis, and imams. And a robot may have the knowledge and understanding of the texts and the processes and the rituals, but it doesn't have the soul. So it isn't convincing. And that's an important takeaway. So thank you, Mel, uh, for- Thank you very much and good night. Good night. And our next speaker, who was supposed to have gotten uh, in our presentation earlier, is Sarah, um, Sarah Own, and she's going to talk about the metaphysics of the human birth. Uh, Sarah, the podium is yours. Dr. Wishti, I think uh, we should go to the next speaker. Sarah didn't make it. She's not here. Okay, that happens. Um, uh, we apologize um, for those who are waiting to hear from Sarah. Uh, hopefully all is well with her. And uh, when we do a follow-up event, um, uh, she will be invited and, and, and share with us the insights. Our um, last speaker, but not the least speaker, um, is a gentleman uh, from uh, Indonesia. 
His presentation is going to be in Indonesian Basa. And uh, if I can ask uh, Haile and Dr. and or Dr. Sri to sort of sum up uh, his insightful words uh, to speak. So uh, my dear brother uh, Dalima, uh, please, the uh, podium is yours. You're on mute, you're on mute. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Salam sejahtera buat kita semua. In promotion and speaking and speaker in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, baik, uh, hari ini uh, saya diberi tugas atau diundang untuk membahas tentang al-iman sain menurut pandangan Islam. Dan pengertian iman secara umum menurut bahasa adalah suatu kepercayaan. Kita tahu memang sebuah keyakinan sebagai umat yang beragama pasti mempunyai keyakinan dan kepercayaan. Begitu pula yang agama lain menurut segi bahasa. Kalau menurut segi istilah, iman itu adalah membenarkan dengan hati, diucapkan dengan lisan, dan diamalkan dengan anggota tubuh. Maka dengan demikian pengertian, pengertian iman kepada Allah adalah membenarkan dengan hati bahwa Allah itu benar-benar ada dengan segala sifat, keagungan, dan kesempurnaannya. Kemudian pengakuan itu diikrarkan dengan lisan, serta dibuktikan dengan amal perbuatan secara nyata. Itulah yang dimaksud dengan pengertian iman. Yang iman juga mengantarkan kepada titik penyadaran diri sebagai hamba Allah, tunduk pada kekuasaannya. Karena di dalam Islam ada yang namanya rukun iman, yaitu enam, kita meyakini dan percaya akan adanya Allah Subhanahu wa taala, kita yakin dan percaya akan adanya malaikat dan kita yakin akan percaya kepada kitab-kitabnya dan kepada nabi-nabi utusan Allah. Dan yang yang berikutnya kita percaya ke dengan hari kiamat atau hari pembelasan dan yang terakhir kita kita percaya dan yakin kepada qadar takdir yang baik dan takdir yang jahat. Sebagaimana firman Allah dalam surat An-Nisa surah keempat ayat 136 yang berbunyi Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Ya ayyuhallazina amanu aminu billahi wa rasulih wal kitabil lazi nazzala ala rasulih wal kitabil lazi anzala min qablu wa man yakfur billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wal yawmil akhiri Wahai orang-orang yang beriman, tetaplah beriman kepada Allah dan Rasulnya Muhammad dan kepada kitab Al-Quran yang diturunkan kepada Rasulnya serta kitab yang diturunkan sebelumnya. Barang siapa ingkar kepada Allah, malaikat-malaikatnya, kitab-kitabnya, Rasul-Rasulnya, dan hari kemudian, maka sesungguhnya orang itu telah tersesat sangat jauh. Surah An-Nisa, surah keempat, ayat ke-136. Ada juga dalam firman Allah surat Al-Hajj yang berbunyi zalika bi anna Allah ahwal haqqu wa anna ma yad'una min dunihi huwal batilu wa anna Allah ahwal aliyul kabir yang artinya demikianlah kebesaran Allah karena Allah dialah Tuhan yang maha hak dan apa saja yang mereka seru selain dia itulah yang batil dan sesungguhnya Allah dialah yang maha tinggi maha besar surah Al-Hajj ayat ke-62. Inilah kekuatan iman bagi umat Islam. Berhubungan dengan sains menurut perspektif Islam, sebagaimana di definisi sains menurut bahasa, sains merupakan uh, menurut bahasa ialah sains dengan dalam bahasa Inggris sains sedangkan kata sains dari bahasa Latin senantia, sentia yang berasal dari kata sain yang artinya adalah mengetahui kata sains dalam bahasa Inggris diterjemahkan sebagai al-alim dalam bahasa Arab. Menurut istilah, sain adalah ilmu bermakna, pengetahuan. Namun demikian menurut Syed Hussein Al-Anas, kata sain secara bahasa Inggris tidak dapat diterjemahkan ke dalam bahasa Arab sebagaimana al-alim atau al-ilmu, karena konsep ilmu pengetahuan yang dipahami oleh Barat pada ada perbedaannya dengan ilmu pengetahuan menurut perspektif Islam. Berdasarkan definisi di atas, dapat ditegaskan bahwa sain adalah suatu proses yang terbentuk dari interaksi akal dan panca indera manusia dan alam sekitarnya dengan arti kata 
objek utama kajian sain adalah alam inspirik, inspirik termasuk juga manusia, sedangkan objek sain yang utama adalah mencari kebenaran. Sain dalam pengertian umum yaitu ilmu pengetahuan. Dalam Al-Quran banyak sekali ayat-ayat yang menyentuh tentang ilmu pengetahuan. Dan ilmu Al-Quran senantiasa mengarahkan manusia untuk menggunakan akal pikiran, menerangkan kemujizatan, dan memberi motivasi meningkatkan ilmu pengetahuan. Sementara itu Rasulullah SAW memberikan pengakuan bahwa al-ilmu itu merupakan pewaris para nabi. Al-Quran juga menjelaskan bahwa yang dimaksud dengan ulama adalah ilmuwan yang mengenali dan mentaati. Inilah salah satu pandangan umat Islam bahwa al-ulama adalah orang yang berilmu, yang mengetahui akan kebesaran Allah menurut sains dan ilmu pengetahuan. Sebagaimana firman Allah dalam surat uh, surat uh, Al-Mujaddalah uh, tentang iman dan ilmu, yang artinya, wahai orang-orang yang beriman, apabila dikatakan kepadamu, berilah kelapangan dalam majelis-majelis, maka lapangkanlah niscaya Allah akan memberi kelapangan untukmu. Dan apabila dikatakan, berdirilah kamu, maka berdirilah niscaya Allah akan mengangkat derajat orang-orang yang beriman, beriman di antara kamu dan orang-orang yang berilmu beberapa derajat. Dan Allah maha mengetahui terhadap apa yang kamu kerjakan. Ada juga dalam surah Al-Alaq yang telah dijelaskan oleh Allah. Al-Iqra bismirabbikallazi halaq. Walakal insana min alaq iqra wa rabbukal akram. Allazi allama bil qalam allamal insana ma lam ya'lam. Bacalah dengan menyebut nama Tuhan yang menciptakan. Dialah menciptakan manusia dari segumpal darah. Bacalah dan dengan Tuhan mulah yang maha mulia. Yang mengajar manusia dengan pena. Dia mengajar manusia apa yang diketahuinya. Dalam surah Al-Alaq ini jelas bahwa surah ini diturunkan sebagai kepada umat manusia untuk membaca, mengetahui kebenaran dan tentang Al-Quran itu sendiri. Selain dalam pengertian khusus mempunyai peran penting dalam kehidupan seorang Muslim, ia dijajar, disejajarkan dengan ilmu-ilmu keislaman yang lain, dan bila didisklifikasikan maka sain ini termasuk parbuki payah, karena dapat memberikan dampak positif bagi peningkatan keimanan seseorang, dapat dilihat pada beberapa hal sebagai berikut tentang memperteguh keyakinan terhadap Allah dengan adanya Al-Quran dan kita memahami iman dan keyakinan kita akan makin kuat. Yang kedua, menyikapi rahasia tashrik, yaitu penetapan hukum. Karena Allah menetapkan, menetapkan sebuah hukum itu bukan karena hak melarang saja, tapi ada manfaat yang baik bagi manusia. Yang berikutnya adalah tentang kemujizatan Al-Quran. Dengan turunnya Al-Quran, kita tahu Bagaimana proses penciptaan manusia dengan sains itulah kita akan mengetahui, memperkuatkan iman kita tentang mukjizat Al-Quran itu sendiri. Yang kedua, menyempurnakan tanggung jawab peribadatan. Dengan ilmu teknologi, dengan sains tadi, kita bisa para 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 orang bisa memprediksikan tentang waktu salat, waktu waktu puasa dan dengan dengan ilmu teknologi untuk peribadatan ini juga lah yang membuat kita akan memahami tentang kapan melaksanakan ibadah puasa dan lain sebagainya. Yang kedua, ada pendekatan Al-Quran terhadap sain. Dalam kajian sain Al-Quran telah memberikan dasar yang jelas, banyak ayat-ayat Al-Quran yang menyentuh berbagai bidang dalam disiplin sain. Dalam buku Quraisy Sain Abdul Zahrahmat telah menyebutkan lebih banyak 27 cabang ilmu sain yang ditentukan oleh Al-Quran, diantaranya kosmologi, astronomi, astrologi, fisika, kimia, serta betani, dan lain sebagainya. Hal ini menjadi bukti terhadap relevansi rele, 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 sain dalam agama. agama. Selain itu, Al-Quran selalu menganjurkan manusia untuk mengesah dan menggunakan nalar. Suatu hal yang perlu diingat bahwa Al-Quran bukanlah kitab sain, maka cara pendekatannya tidak sama dengan cara sain modern. Pendekatan sain memisahkan suatu diri semua yang ada kemudian menganalisa secara terperinci sedangkan Al-Quran berbicara tentang sain dalam bentuk holistik atau global serta ditempatkan pada berbagai surah di antaranya dalam surah 14, 73, dan 24 surah Al-Baqarah ada juga dalam surah surah Ali Imran tentang tentang ilmu dan sain ada juga dalam surah An-Nur tentang 61 tentang ilmu sain ada juga surah al-mukminun juga membahas tentang sain dari pembahasan yang tadi lebih kurang kesimpulannya 
dalam upaya mengajari manusia memahami dan mengenal kekuasaan dan keagungan Tuhannya Al Tuhannya Al-Qur'an telah menekankan akan arti pentingnya manusia menggunakan akal pikiran serta panca indera bahkan Al-Qur'an mengibaratkan manusia yang tidak menggunakan pikiran dan panca indranya laksana binatang ternak bahkan lebih jelek daripada itu oleh sebab itu manusia selalu diingatkan untuk senantiasa membuat observasi berpikir secara reflektif dan membuat penganalisa serta kritis serta membuat pertimbangan yang matang secara umum kajian sains menggunakan dua metode yaitu observasi eksperimen di mana kedua-duanya akan melibatkan fungsi akal dan panca indera akal bukanlah hanya satu objek yang terletak di kepala sebagaimana otak akal merupakan daya untuk merasa atau berpikir yang memberikan kekuatan kepada manusia untuk memperhatikan dan mengkaji, memilih dan membuat keputusan terhadap sesuatu perkara atau langkah-langkah serta berbagai macam persoalan yang dihadapi untuk mencapai yang diingatkan. Mungkin uh, itu dapat disampaikan karena ilmu sains ini sangat penting bagi iman karena dengan kekuatan ilmu pengetahuan maka iman seseorang akan menjadi lebih kuat karena melihat melihat bukti kebesaran Allah Tuhan yang Maha Esa. Terima kasih. Thank you. Uh, terus di sidi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you brother uh, for your presentation. If I can have brother Mazan uh, summarize uh, okay. what uh, you just said. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, terima kasih Pak Dalimi dan juga uh, and also Mr. Rushdi Sadiki what I I have been actually Less, listen attentively. Attentively, you. Well, I can summarize uh, what has been mentioned here uh, on the strength of uh, knowledge, on the strength of knowledge uh, of the Muslim, uh, based on uh, what has been mentioned in the Al Quran as our holy book. Uh, uh, people, uh, Muslim are encouraged to seek knowledge uh, uh, in a very holistic way, and also uh, based on the sign as. Uh, Uh, as a knowledge uh, to sustain uh, uh, in making decision, uh, in practicing the faith of Islam, and how uh, a science uh, has been, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, been mentioned in 27, uh, there are 27 principles of science is, has been mentioned in Islam. Uh, that also include about, about uh, medica me medication, about uh, astronomical uh, aspect of knowledge and also uh, it also mentioned through science uh, we uh, hum as human will be able to strengthen our faith as guided by our holy book of uh, al-quran uh, he also mentioned about the tra uh, the transformation of uh, uh, human you know a transformation of my, 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 i mean As narrated by our holy prophet and described in Al Quran, uh, Imam um, Iman Iman and also knowledge is uh, reciprocating, uh, uh, going in tandem, in order to make uh, hu uh, Muslim or even human uh, wise in making any decision uh, as uh, guided by the Al Quran. Okay, uh, uh, among other things, also. Uh, Mr. Dalimi mentioned about the, the artificial uh, on the need to uh, what you call it uh, read uh, is mentioned in uh, our the early verses of Al Quran or uh, uh, what you call it uh, Surah Isra. Uh, uh, our Prophet, our Holy Prophet, was asked to recite. You know, uh, uh, the first uh, the first uh, went uh, the. Uh, The angel Jibril asked our Holy Prophet or uh, Surah Surah is uh, Ikra Ikra Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. He mentioned about that. Uh, we are encouraged to read and also to attain uh, the knowledge and also uh, to understand uh, whatever transpire in our holy book. Uh, that is what I can summarize. Maybe Che uh, Azhar can assist also if he may understand. <laughs> So uh, that's about it, Mr. J. I think it's a very powerful message uh, that he, uh, Mr. Dalimi, had actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, give to us. Uh, very, uh, but I was not able to uh, translate it uh, uh, very well because I quite fast in capturing. Uh,
his presentation. <laughs> so sorry. Oh. No, that, that's okay. Uh, Brother Mazen, thank you very much for paying attention at a very long and insightful so seminar much. to uh, uh, translate what uh, Brother Dalima um, spoke about. His were powerful words, and uh, I think Ikra Bismi Rabakal Khalqan read is the essence of um, what a number of speakers uh, start with and then what read means and knowledge means and then it further breaks down. So thank you for translating. Um, our last speaker and we had to um, switch around uh, internet issues, etc. cetera. Um, looking forward to it, uh, Sarah Owen. Um, Sarah, looking forward to listening and learning from your presentation on the metaphysics on the human birth. Sarah, please. Okay. Um. Uh. I think there's another issue again. Oh, is is it um, audio? Is is because no, we can't hear her. Should you, maybe if uh, we remove the visual part from her presentation with her permission and she speaks about it, maybe the connectivity would be better. Sarah? She's not dialing, it's okay. I think we go to the QA. Okay, so I, I believe we're done. Um, yes. Okay. So um, apologies, Sarah, for um, your inability to connect uh, technology issues. That's one of the downsides of the Zoom um, environment. So um, we've learned a lot in the last um, two and a half hours um, uh, or so. And if we were to break this thing down of AI, faith, and science, AI is basically... Um, seeking knowledge, uh, seeking knowledge, um, and one of the attainment of that knowledge is technology. And we have to look at technology in a holistic way that's aligned to what the faith espouses. So that's uh, one takeaway on AI. The faith, faith is about the soul, belief in the unseen. So there's this consistency about technology aligned to the faith. We shouldn't be slave to technology. And science, science explains by evidence base to those that want to basically see, feel, and hear. Um, their interpretation of religion is different and we all respect that. So there is this alignment between AI, technology, faith, which is about the soul, whether it's Hinduism, Christianity, Catholicism, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, and science, which is evidence-based. So hopefully um, uh, you all had good insights and takeaways from our esteemed uh, panelists. And I'd like to thank them for their time, their research and their words that they shared with us, um, starting off with Dr. Ansari at Asia E University uh, and uh, finishing it up with our dear brother from Indonesia. To all of you, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we look forward to future seminars um, and there'll be announcements uh, shortly about our next seminar. We hope to make this event an annual event and a bigger event. The uptake of this has been very interesting and insightful and I think we can build on that momentum. So to all our esteemed uh, speakers, to all our guests, stay safe, be well, and God willing, we will see you soon. Thank you. Have a good night. Salaamu Alaikum. Namaskar. Peace. Thank you. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Thank you, Dr. Rashdi. Thank you.